Hi, I'm Roshni. Hi, I'm Malcolm. Uh, so Malcolm, could you please tell us a bit about your project? I saw you speaking um, at the uh, beginning there, so just, uh, just you know, a um, uh, small gist on what your project is, what do you think of blockchain, what do you think of Bitcoin, and just your thoughts, basically. Right. Uh, two of the most profitable uh, industry sectors right now in terms of tokens, uh, in terms of projects, are protocols or infrastructure, as well as exchanges. So we at Cube Exchange is one, of course the latter, is an exchange project. And what sets us apart from other exchanges is that we are quantum resistant. So we are the first quantum resistant uh, exchange that is coming out to the market. Now why quantum resistance is very important is because with uh, cryptocurrency, with blockchain, one of the key features is that it's secure. That means it's not possible to get a hack against the system. Uh, unfortunately, with quantum computing on the cusp of uh, coming to the main market, especially with Google's announcement one or two months ago that there has been a successful launch of uh, quantum computing, uh, it is in imminent that hackers would be able to access computing power that is strong enough to overcome every exchange. Mm. So with us being quantum resistant, we'll be the only exchange that's basically resistant to such hacking attacks. So this is a very, very powerful use case for this. Now, what, we, what I firmly believe is that cryptocurrencies, digital assets and securitization of assets is going to be something that the next 5 to 10 years will see uh, on the rise. And I believe that digital assets is going to be a new asset class. And all these digital assets need a place to be traded on. So that's why an exchange is a natural place for these exchanges to be traded between the investors and the supporters of projects. Okay, that's lovely. That's lovely. So uh, with your project, what's the consensus mechanism? Uh, the, it, it is basically a proof of work. All right, and basically it's a quantum resistant uh, protocol. So this protocol is still being built. It's a quantum resistant ledger and we're able to on onboard other ledgers that are quantum resistant as well. So it's an open architecture. So for me to say that it's a certain proof is also not that accurate because we'll be able to onboard other kinds of uh, protocols. Okay, that's great. When's your ma uh, main net releasing? It's already, it's already functional in terms of the exchange, it's already operational, the, the tokens are already in, in operation, uh, but there will be constant refinements to the protocol and in, in sync with the regulatory approvals and compliance, uh, it will take another 6 to 12 months for us to get a regulatory and compliance, uh, regulatory approvals and licenses and that's about the time frame that we see for the QRP protocol to be up and running as well. Okay, that's great. That's great. And uh, so, what's your general overview on on STOs? You know, like, do you think they are the next big thing, or are we still, are we like, do we still have to get there, or are we already there with with the technology? So, what's what's your view on it? Um, I believe that more and more assets will be tokenized. So, for example, uh, fractionalization of real estate is already happening in some countries, and yes, this I is agree. a very simple use case. Uh, the real estate market is, I think, two to three hundred trillion in the market, wow. and if this two to three hundred trillion, even a fraction of it, can be tokenized, you know, that's a huge market already. Uh, not only security token, not only uh, real estate, but other kinds of uh, commodities. For example, uh, gold can be commoditized. Um, equities can be commoditized. So, for example, shares of a of a company. You already see this happening in IPOs in terms of public listings where the, the equity of a company is publicly owned and with, with security tokens coming in, it's very easy for it to translate to equities as well. So just the two largest asset classes, equities and real estate, and of course the derivatives on top of these can already be securitized. So it's, it's not limited. Basically everything can be securitized because if you look back 20, 30 years ago, there was no internet and hardly anyone was online. But now, basically, the whole world who's connected is online, Absolutely. right? So eventually, all asset classes will also be online. Right, okay. So what do you think about regulatory perspective? How would that fall into play with STOs? Uh, every country has its own take on securities. So every country has a different uh, law with regards to securities. So the same thing will happen or is happening with security token offerings. 
most countries, when they first encountered cryptocurrencies, uh, treated it as securities if they had securities characteristics, or treated them as commodities or no specification in terms of what they were uh, because they didn't know how to deal with it. And more and more governments are recognizing that they need to regulate and have the laws regarding this. So what I see in terms of the market are a few major treatments of, of such asset classes. Firstly, they can treat it as a licensing regime. So licensing means that it will be an activity that requires a license in order for you to be a token issuer. So this is a position that's being taken in, uh, by, say, Singapore, by Estonia. So it's, it's possible for you to get a crypto to fiat license or a wallet license from Estonia, for example. And Singapore is going to, going to come up soon. A second method is the sponsorship method, which is similar to an IPO. Right? If you do an uh, initial public offering, you will need to get a sponsor firm to sponsor you and say you are legit and then you can go up. So countries like, uh, like Germany, like Malta, are using a sponsorship method where there is a third party that will audit the project before it can be launched. So these are a couple of the existing methods. Just to make sure that, uh, just to make sure that you know it's safe and and you know like the security-wise everything is just not going to be a problem. Yes. They, they pass the audit and the the compliance requirements to somebody else. So these are just two of the treatments. There are other treatments that that treat uh, commodities or they, that treat it as just commodities, or that treat digital assets as information and not even a commodity. So every country is struggling with this right now, and I believe that probably in, in 10 years' time, every country would have uh, an understanding of how it wants to, to regulate. Uh, but for now, countries are still struggling with this. Yeah. Well, Malcolm, you are from Singapore, and I can say from, from all that I've heard that Singapore is just making the right ways to, to be one of the best countries out there for, for blockchain and, and all this. Basically, the, the country of, you know, um, with where you can actually take an idea and build it there and, you know, be, be successful and most importantly, just, you know, get, get the public to use it for, like, adoption. And it's actually paving the right way. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that you are from Singapore. And how do you feel for being a part of such an advanced country? Uh, Singapore is, uh, has a very unique position in terms of the, the uh, world geopolitics and the economic situation because it's a, it's a very nice gateway between East and West. Yes. Uh, it's English speaking, so the West will definitely like to set, set up in Singapore and then penetrate Asia. And it's also um, Eastern language speaking. So, for example, we have majority is Chinese. So many Chinese projects who want to launch into the West will come to Singapore. So East meets West, that's one of the key advantages. Secondly, the government is very uh, strict and has a very good reputation. Uh, in fact, criminals steer clear away from Singapore. So it gives a very uh, good and encouraging political, uh, very low political risk. So country, companies and MNCs all like to set up in Singapore because there's very low corruption or no corruption Absolutely. and it's very easy to do business. Singapore traditionally ranks you know, top three in most metrics in the world as well. Like top three in terms of airports, top three in terms of shipping port, uh, top three in terms of ease and convenience of doing business, uh, in terms of uh, low corruption index. Uh, so all these measures make it an international business centre. Uh, the only problem with Singapore is that it's a very small population. So the, the captive market is very small, it's only five to six million people. But Singapore is the capital of the greater um, Southeast Asian market. The ASEAN countries are number about 700 plus million people. And many of them come to Singapore to set up the, the HQ, the headquarters, and then penetrate to the region. So this is a way that a lot of companies uh, interact with Singapore. Well, that's great. That's, uh, that's amazing. That's Malcolm from Cube Exchange. It was very nice talking to you. Thank you.